With Japan's recently elected Prime Minister General Tojo whipping up the mighty Nipponese war machine to a fanatical tempo, the year 1942 opened on a dismal note for the Allies. The troops in Malaya, including Australia's doomed 8th Division, hopelessly outnumbered and outgunned, had been pushed back onto the island of Singapore, there to surrender on the 15th of February. Four days later came a blow which rocked our nation, the bombing of Darwin, the first attack on Australian soil. Darwin, an army, naval and air force base in name but not in strength. A few hundred soldiers, a smattering of ACAC guns, a handful of obsolete aircraft. At first light that fateful morning, 81 bombers from a carrier force screamed in, followed by 54 land-based planes from the Celebes. By nightfall on the bottom of Darwin Harbour lay the American destroyer Peary, two American transports, a British tanker and four Australian ships. 243 lives and 10 aircraft had been lost. The war was on our northern doorstep. It was a rude awakening to Australians, and Prime Minister John Curtin, courageously defiant to Roosevelt and Churchill, was quick to drive home this significant lesson. My Lord Mayor, men and women of Australia, for I'm speaking now to everybody in this Commonwealth, wherever he or she may be. The full cabinet today directed the war cabinet to gazette the necessary regulations for the complete mobilization and the complete ordering of all the resources, human and material, in this Commonwealth for the defense of this Commonwealth. That means clearly and specifically that every human being in this country is now, whether he or she likes it, at the service of the government to work in the defense of Australia. The Philippines were in Japanese hands. Tojo was thrusting his trident further south. One prong aimed at Rabaul, the second at Timor, and the third at Balak Papan in oil-rich Dutch Borneo. And to complete the isolation of Java, the final objective on the eastern flank was the New Guinea mainland. The dark cloud of Japanese aggression was spreading unchecked. John Curtin's call to arms echoed throughout the nation. The wheels of industry turned faster. The furnaces and mills at Newcastle were strained to the limit. But the capacity of the plants was hopelessly inadequate. Yet despite these apparent insurmountable hurdles, output climbed. With more raids on Darwin, the need for more planes grew every minute. Almost overnight, the aircraft industry was born and christened number one priority by the Prime Minister. Beaufort bombers appeared, Pratt and Whitney engines. A full-scale industry was in motion, confounding the expectations of the most optimistic. The northern bombing had sounded a grim warning that any part of our coastline was vulnerable to air attack, but every man, woman and child was likely at any moment to hear the whistle of a falling bomb. It was all hands and the cook and the kids to the task of digging slip trenches and building shelters. Age was no bar to this workforce operating in schools, in playgrounds, in parks and backyards. With the growing demand for more food, those engaged in primary industries were exempted from the forces. But the men on the land were fully aware of the threat of invasion. And so came into being the Volunteer Defence Corps. Bushmen born in the saddle, ready-made snipers, eager to be organised and trained in the tricks of the guerrilla fighter.
willing students of the art of demolition, sabotage, and the mixing of Molotov cocktails. The London Blitz, the Battle of Britain, these early chapters of World War II were filled with the heroic home front exploits of ARP wardens. The ceaseless vigil of plane spotters and fire watchers. The lessons learned from bitter and tragic experience in the motherland were passed on to us. Usherettes in our cinemas were among the thousands who practiced with shovels and sand how to combat incendiary bombs. No uniforms were required. The job could be done even in an evening dress. Who would care about looks in a national emergency? Statistics and research in England proved that in an air raid, glass shattered by bomb blast was as great a danger to life and limb as the missiles themselves. So out came shop windows, and hoardings took their place. Window shoppers were allowed only peepholes. In homes and factories, windows were taped and papered to reduce fragmentation. Tests proved indisputably that the danger of flying glass could be minimized by a backdrop of mosquito net or lace curtain. Necessary nuisance, but an important part in the general scheme of camouflage, which included motor buses. Even dogs had a place in this all-out effect. Any breed was welcome, so long as the recruit was big, strong and healthy. Hundreds answered the call to the canine colours. Trained to obey only one master, they were used as guards patrolling factories, aerodromes, camps and vital installations. And their efficiency was exceeded only by their savagery. Poachers of peace become dogs of war. Following John Curtin's proclamation, Federal Minister Beasley frankly told of the need for food conservation. Our job is a vital one to plan foodstuffs and production for every seaman, airman and soldier as well as the civilian population throughout Australia and thus provide for all in the hard times that lie ahead. Any surplus that is available we will make available to our gallant kinsfolk overseas. With the three armed forces draining our manpower, the women were not slow to volunteer for part-time duties with the VAD, voluntary aid detachments, and NES, National Emergency Services. Unlike the First World War, this was now a woman's battle too. Firemen stepped up their training and checked equipment to meet the inevitable sequel to an aerial attack. In Queensland, the plan was perfected to use seawater from the Brisbane River. Twelve Sydney brigades fought all one night as flames gutted this five-storey factory and as high winds spread dangerous sparks, more than 100 air raid wardens acted as fire spotters from adjacent rooftops. A disastrous Sydney fire which provided a taste of what could be expected in an air raid. Coastal shipping traffic was never thicker. Ships were never more valuable. So it was a bitter blow when this freighter ran aground after a collision off the New South Wales north coast. A fire and a shipwreck for which the enemy could not be blamed at the opening of 1942.